All right, good morning, everybody. Nine o'clock. Welcome to Jail Car. There's Representative Schmidt. So we have a quorum. And Representative Hacken Phillips, you should be in for Senator Whitley. The minutes of the previous meeting. All right, Rep Senator Ward moves to accept the, the uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a second? Second, second by Represent Representative Schmidt. Any corrections, comments? All right, seeing none, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, and there we go. And the consent agenda. Is there anything to be removed from consent? Hearing none, I move the consent calendar. Second. Okay, moved by Representative Schmidt, second by Representative Lind. Any comments, questions? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. The first three items on the regular agenda have been asked to um, be postponed by the agency. Uh, the, the third one, the Board of Home Inspectors needs a waiver as well um, because and of Mrs. Deadline. I, I apologize, Madam Chair. Um, the first item, 2023-97, that item, they're actually asking to be moved till March because the board does not meet until February 16th. So that one, if it is accepted, would need a waiver as well. Thank you for that clarification. So the the motion would be to postpone item A to the March meeting and request a waiver and postpone B and C to the February meeting and C need, also needs a waiver of its deadline. That is my motion. Thank you, Representative Schmidt. Any discussion, comments, questions? All right, those in favor? Aye. 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 Was opposed? All right. Madam Chair, I don't believe there was a second. Representative Lynn second. I thought I heard Representative Lynn, but I could be confused. I did too, but. All right. I didn't hear you. Yes, you did. All right. Senator Gray, you're sitting in for Senator Wang, who doesn't isn't here today. All right. All right, Health and Human Services. So this proposal has one sort of minor issue. It's a, a very broad citation, and um, think, we think for clarity purposes it should be a, a more specific citation. But I think that the fix for this is just an oral CA, just to say what citation to change it to. So that's my suggestion. Okay. Uh, good morning, Nicole Valenzola, Rules Coordinator for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, yes, that's correct. We, uh, it was a misunderstanding on my part. I had responded in saying, yes, we could make that edit. I didn't submit, uh, I thought it was an edit, not a conditional approval request. So if you will allow that, I will do that. <laughs> okay. Any questions from the committee? A motion? Um, I can move a conditional approval um, citing HEW uh, 50202 um, in, as noted by the attorneys. Second. Okay. Any, any further, any discussion, questions or comments? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Board of Mental Health Practice. Okay, this item was postponed from the last meeting um, because there had been some testimony submitted from the New Hampshire Behavioral Health Association, and the committee felt that the um, that the board needed to revisit um, that the letters that were submitted and to um, consider maybe making some changes to the rule. Um, there is linked on our website uh, an amended um, the an amended conditional approval request. It may be titled uh, revised conditional approval request, 
but if you look on the third page of the linked PDF, you will see that the board has made some changes there. Um, the association had had um, stated that they felt that the required um, hours, 4,000 hours, couldn't be met within, um, well, one, they misunderstood the rule. They thought that, that um, the maximum that was allowed was 2,000 hours, but the rule, in fact, does say a minimum. And, um, <clears throat> and then they also felt that that the rule forced people to get those required hours within um, two year time period, but that's not what the rule said. Um, the board has tweaked the rule a little bit to address those issues, and, and I think it, it's fine. If you look there, on, like I said, on page three of the linked PDF, they've changed that to be clear that, it, that the four hours, 4,000 hours have to be completed within two years, but no more than four years. So I think that's a little clear. And then I believe um, also on the next page, they made the same change. So um, I, with that, I have no other issues. There are a couple other editorial comments, but I had no, nothing else on this proposal. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Lindsay Courtney, Executive Director, Office of Professional Licensure and Certification. So I will address um, the, the stakeholder concerns and then I'll defer um, to a rulemaking coordinator as well as the board chair who's present regarding any other changes the board has made. Um, I did have a lengthy conversation with the stakeholder who had concerns with this rule to get a better understanding of what the concerns were. And it appears that the concerns really stem from a misunderstanding of the enabling statute um, that allows this rule to move forward. So if you may recall, I think it was back in 2019 legislative session, um, the legislature established additional license types for the Board of Mental Health Practice. Um, Two of those license types were to establish a different additional categories, licensed social work associate for those educated at the associate um, degree level, um, licensed social worker for those educated with a bachelor baccalaureate. And then the statute also established conditional licenses, which are the license types that were at issue or brought forward with the stakeholder concerns. So several other states have a fourth category of licensure, which is a non-clinical category of licensure for master's educated um, individuals. Vermont is, is one of those states. Um, and there was some confusion that the conditional license, the, con the enabling statute establishing the conditional licenses was establishing that fourth category. And so with the misunderstanding that essentially this would be a permanent license for non-clinical work at the master's level, they had concerns with essentially the four-year cap on having that license. Um, I think we now understand that the statute did not establish that category um, and that, that if they do wish to move forward with establishing that category that they're, um, they need to do so legislatively. So that's kind of the gist of um, the stakeholder concerns. Okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions and I oh, defer. If, if I understand correctly from some other legislation and process the conditional license is so that a person who has graduated but is getting their supervised practice has a license so that they can independently bill. That's or correct. At least, at least bill somebody. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Does anyone else have a question? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Tina Kelly, Rules Coordinator for OPLC. If you have any other questions, I'd be glad to assist. Okay. I think you've answered all our questions. Thank you. <laughs> all right, do we have a motion? Move the item. Second. Discussion, questions, comments? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you very much. The Water Council. So this was also a proposal that was um, postponed from the last meeting. 
and there's a conditional approval that is, was sent in and there seems to only be one remaining issue it's on page 35 and it's essentially the the deadlines that the agency is setting do not comply with 541A29 and so that's the only issue I have now. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Mark Delafano. I am the Turn the mic on, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm better than that, <laughs> generally. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Delafano. I'm an assistant attorney general from the Department of Justice, and I represent the Water Council. Uh, there are actually two issues in the conditional approval that appear to be uh, uh, left in from comments from uh, legislative services. We'll deal with the first one on 33. Uh, firstly, that comment uh, states that, uh, that the rule on declaratory rulings must comply with RSA 541A29. The, the language of RSA uh, 541A29, in fact, exempts declaratory rulings from the statute. We wrote a letter to uh, legislative services regarding this issue, and uh, we never received a response other than finding ourselves on the uh, regular agenda today. Mm. Okay. I did not receive that letter, but I, I see what you're saying now in the rule about the declaratory ruling. We, we would have changed that comment if we'd seen that. Now, one thing to just mention here as well is that the Water Council rules are the same uh, with some minor changes that are Water Council specific to the rules for the other three environmental councils. So the Air Resources Council, the Waste Management Council, and the uh, uh, Wetlands Council. Uh, these rules are, for the most part, uniform across all of them. So some of these changes, for instance, the one that was suggested on page 33, was never suggested in either of the three prior uh, versions of the other council's rules, but otherwise are materially the same. Uh, the other comment that remained is on page uh, 32. Madam Chair, just yes. to, sure. on that one, make sure that uh, you guys do forward a letter to them that they didn't receive so their records are complete. Yeah, absolutely, I brought a copy with me today. I appreciate okay, that. So on page 32. Now on page 32 uh, on item D, and this is uh, EC Water uh, 2107D, uh, we had suggested, um, well, first off, Legislative Services had crossed out the May and asked us to insert shall. The other three council rules have May. And the reason why we would prefer a may there than a shell is because this is a removal provision. The presiding officer can remove counsel for a party at one of these hearings, uh, but we want that to be a permissive removal, not a mandatory removal. And so our suggested change was to go from, they said shall, we said is authorized to. And that would be a departure from the may language that's in the other three rules. Thank you. Um, comment? I would note that the language that was suggested is equivalent to saying may, is, when you say is authorized to. Right. Well, I think that the subcategories one and two look like the criteria for a removal, and therefore may would be not unreasonable, in my opinion. Agree. I, I believe I've looked at this rule and some of the other ones that they've brought forward before, and I think that's where the committee had landed on that particular issue. And I believe on um, on the other issue on declaratory judgments that, um, like Christina said, if we had seen that, then that would have been we would have removed that comment. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Do we have a motion? I'd like to move the question. So you're moving to approve the rule? Thank you. Sorry. Moving Second. to approve. Trouble. Second. Okay. Discussion? Comments? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. And sorry Aye. about the confusion.
Department of Agriculture. So 2023-243 is an agricultural rule on acquisition of agricultural land development rights. And um, there are still a few um, issues with the rule. Starting on page two, there's a rule that requires filing an application with the committee and municipality. And then later it needs to be with the agency. And so there's it just needs to be more consistency there. So it, a person knows where they're filing and with who. Um, there's a few places where the the wording is just unclear. It's just unclear as written and should be changed. That's on page four and five and on page 12. Um, page six, there's deadlines that don't comply with um, 541A29. Um, and on page eight, there's some uh, subjective language that we would like changed um, because subjective language is not good for orals. Commissioner? Yeah, this could have been fixed probably with a conditional approval. So, I'm sorry? I said this. Th these, these issues could have been fixed with a conditional approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, this is Patricia Benner for, um, I'm the legislative coordinator for the Department of Agriculture. Um, and I apologize for uh, not having the conditional approval um, in time. Um, I think there, there wasn't much turnaround from receiving committee's uh, comments, but we are working on correcting those issues and clarifying some of the um, um, ambiguity in the new rule. Um, you, Should you we postpone for... dealing with this until you have the, had the opportunity to complete it? Well, thank you. And um, for the record, Sean Jasper, Commissioner of the Department, and um, I think we were a little unclear where we were supposed to go with these changes. We have made suggested changes, um, but didn't appear that there was any place uh, for us to submit them in, in time. So we have the language, but um, so I, it's been a long time since I sat on the committee and things have changed and we really weren't expecting this because we were, it was a readoption, and obviously these things were in the rules that had uh, previously been in place. But okay. uh, I don't know if you um, want to discuss what we have suggested or not. If it's a, a, a postponement with a waiver would would be in order, and that would give us time. We can we can work with the agency. Yes, and please make sure that that your instructions on how to respond to comments that are clearer. Yes. We'd hate to have this happen again. Yes. Okay, so. Um, Madam Chair, I'll motion and mm -hmm. postponement with waiver. All right. Is there a second? Lay on. Lay on second. Okay, thank you. I didn't hear you. No. All right. It, further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And before you go, we might as well deal with the fact that the previous rules have been expired for 15 years. And I'm wondering what you've done since then. We have not purchased any properties since then because we had no money and that's why they were allowed to, to expire. I will um, let, you, let you know that um, right now there's a statutory change and we weren't anticipating that these rules would necessarily be used because we'll be working with other organizations. However, we've had some pretty exciting news to us that a landowner in uh, Dublin, where we do hold current easements, wants to make a donation um, of additional land. So the rules are going to be necessary, even though there's not going to be any uh, money exchanged. I think we'll still need to use them to have this Donation. So they're looking to, to move forward. Uh, and I uh, guess we can't do anything until we get that. And the committee uh, is being reconstituted. And at the next GNC, the, the um, 
new newest members of the committee will be appointed and will be back up and, and running. So apologize that we had some some confusion about what was going on here. And um, okay, well, I'm glad to know that the you haven't been enforcing expired no. rules. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Congratulations on the donation. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Senator Gray. You're in for Senator Innes. Okay, fish and game. So this rule is 2023-248, licenses and permits. And I actually, the, the agency did a great job at um, responding to my comments. So there's only one issue which i think is solved because it's a typo on the there's a, there's a typo on the revision note of one of the forms and i think you guys fixed that right so then i have no more no more comments okay good morning i'm marty mobley i'm the league coordinator for fish and game and with me today hi good morning my name is jessica wheelahan i'm the licensing supervisor for fish and game we recently had a new um website uh, instituted and so we put all of our licensing forms online so the vast majority of the changes we're doing is to add the link to the online licenses um, and there were a couple of other updates to go along with we updated some wildlife rules that went into effect in june so we needed to make a couple of changes on some of our licenses to include a, an additional bear tag um, and, and, and a couple of other little tweaks, but that's this is mostly just to be consistent. I didn't get the comments. I still haven't got the comments. So I would, uh, and I agree, all of the uh, comments could have been addressed in a conditional approval. Um, but I did speak with Christina last week, and I got her the form that I had neglected to uh, include in the original final proposal, and then there is the typo that that dis disagreed that I had put zero one and it was supposed to be one zero. Is there a problem getting messages in and out of your office? I don't know, but it seems like there may be. So we're gonna go ahead and go back and look at into that. Okay. Is that find out what's going on? Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, the you finally received the comments and are willing to con to make a conditional approval request incorporating those comments. Is that Can correct? I make a conditional approval request? I don't think a conditional approval, because the only issue is on a form, and so the form just needs to be ed edited. I think, no, I think it's the text needs to be edited. The form, I think, is correct. Or, I don't oh. know, I'd, I'd have to look, on, I'd have to look. If the text needs to be edited, to then do. it could be a conditional approval. Yeah, I think I think because I think it's the text that says zero one. It's revised. Yeah, yeah. and cut and the Senator form Gray. says. Madam 10. Chair, is a motion to approve, uh, pending the uh, incorporation of the comments appropriate at this time. I believe it would be. I move. A second. Pending incorporation. Right. Any further comments or questions from the committee? Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. please uh, hope we can get the communication issue straightened out. All right. And we think, oh, that's, we don't have the water sa watercraft safety rules yet, correct? That is correct. We have not received that response, but the agency has until February 5th to submit that to us. Okay. So no trouble. And the home builders and uh, contractors are still talking with DES about alteration of terrain and not ready to talk to us. And this petition... Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, most of the committee probably has not seen this before, but under RSA 541A4, an individual can petition an agency 
uh, to amend or adopt rules or repeal rules. Um, and under the committee's own rules, um, an individual can or a group can request Gelcar to petition the agency. Uh, the requirement for that is that they first um, petition the agency and be denied. In this instance, um, clients of Donald Funstein have uh, requested that they be able to, they apparently sell vacation homes. Um, right now, the rules of uh, DOJ require that the packet of materials uh, regarding sales must be uh, hard copy. Um, the request for the petition asks that they be allowed to disseminate that uh, electronically. Um, the AG, the request is in here. Also, the AG's response when it denied the petition, um, the AG's office apparently feels, and they're here, I believe, uh, that uh, because of the importance of such a sale, that it's better to have it in paper than electronically, that uh, the potential purchasers may pay more attention to a hard copy than an electronic copy. Is the agency here? Is AG here to help this? Yes, please. We'd like to hear your side of it. Courtney Lockwood, I'm a staff attorney at the Department of Environmental Services. Uh, I know nothing about this. We've heard nothing about this. Uh, we were here a few months ago when the Home Builders Association uh, sent the committee a letter, which we didn't receive a copy of ahead of time. Um, I, I don't. Oh, excuse me. I, this oh, is, am I, I? You're the wrong person. We're looking. For okay, the I'm sorry. The office. Attorney General. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> D DES, as far as we know, is still peacefully working back at their office. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chairman. My name is J.R. Davis. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Consumer Protection and Antitrust Bureau of the Department of Justice Attorney General's Office. Uh, we are opposed to this proposed change. Before I go through any of the details, I just want to make sure that the committee has the benefit of the letter that we transmitted electronically to the director yesterday. Um, I believe that's in our pack, the last one, a page of our packet. Yes, the last it is. three pages of our packet. In a, the thicker packet contains both the request uh, from Mr. Funstein and uh, the AG's response. In a separate attachment are the current uh, JUS rules that uh, the request relates to. And I'm at the preference of the committee whether you want us to go explain the basis for our objection to the change of our longstanding rule or to respond uh, once the petitioner's attorney, who I believe is present today, makes a presentation. I leave it totally up to the committee as to who goes first. Um, I think the, the petitioner. Agent. Oh, the, the petitioner's point is is pretty clear. We'd like to, they just want to send it electronically with the option for hard copy, and which we all understand. So if you could explain your opposition to that idea. C certainly. Uh, just so it's clear, there's nothing under the, and if I'm too loud, let me know because I'm not used to using microphones. Um, there's nothing under our rules that prohibits the delivery uh, of the public offering statement electronically. There's something in our rules that requires a hard copy. And we believe that that is fundamentally important. So first off, from the standpoint of convenience to the consumer, there's nothing that prohibits electronic delivery of a public offering statement or any of the other solicitating documents associated with someone who's prospectively entering into a purchase and sales agreement regarding either a regulated subdivision or a regulated condominium. The reason I say regulated, as I'm sure the members of the committee is aware, not all subdivisions are regulated by the Bureau. Not all condominiums are regulated by the Bureau. It depends upon whether it's residential only or whether there's a certain number of units. Um, the reason 
or reasons that the Bureau is steadfastly opposed to this proposed change is because the General Court has given our Bureau charge of protecting consumers in a very complicated legal minefield area of law. Normally, all things being equal, there are very few areas of New Hampshire commerce that are as regulated and as prescribed statutorily as land transactions involving developments of subdivisions or the transfer of units in condominiums. All things being equal, with certain exceptions for fraud and the transactions involving the sale of securities and certain insurance provisions and certain provisions regarding transfer of automobiles, the statutes by and large adopt some version of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Because of the concern that this general court had and I believe still has regarding the prospect for consumer fraud, consumer misunderstanding, consumer confusion, and people not knowing what it is they're buying when they're spending thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in purchasing what might just be a one-week rental, but most of the time and quite often involves their home place. And for that reason, the general court specified in both RSA Chapter 356A dealing with subdivisions and RSA 360, excuse me, 356B dealing with condominiums, mandatory requirement in the vast majority of cases of a public offering statement. And the public offering statement, as that phrase is used in both statutes, is similar to the concept of a prospectus whenever someone is looking to invest in a financial instrument stock, bond, debenture, whatever. The statute is very clear as to what has to be in those public offering statements. The statutes are very clear that the Attorney General's Office has to actually approve them and actually designates the form that they should be in so that you can take a public offering statement from one condominium and another one, and although they will not be the identical language because the projects will be different. There, will, there is a general format in which what gets disclosed in what order, all based upon requirements that are contained in the statute. The concern that the Bureau has is not, to be quite honest, with the petitioner. If Riverwalk was the only entity that was developing, promoting, and selling condominiums and subdivisions within the state of New Hampshire, we wouldn't need the regulation. But Riverwalk is not the only entity. They are but one of hundreds of entities, if not thousands of entities, that develop, promote, and sell new condominium projects and new subdivisions. And the condominiums, again, can either be full-time or some version of integral ownership. And Riverwalk's project is both. Our concern is, is that although there are consumers who have computers or other tablets of sufficient size to be able to download and be able to meaningfully read and review these detailed single page lined legal documents, we think that is the exception to the rule. We already know from our previous experience in the Bureau, and again, we're the agency that receives most consumer complaints regarding the conduct of business within the state. We already know that there has been a plethora of problems with people receiving electronic disclosures only regarding important contracts and legal documents. We have no problem with electronic disclosure. We think for people who want it, it's great. But we think that everyone ought to have and ought not have the ability to opt out of the physical copy. Now, I've brought for the benefit of the committee copies of Riverwalk's last approved public offering statement, not the numerous documents that are attached to it that would end up making it about three pages thick, but 
the actual narrative description. And with the permission of the chairman, I would hand those out. Can Not you? knowing whether all the members of the committee have actually ever bought a condominium. Not all of us have. I'm Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> and I want to correct my letter. I said it was 18 pages plus the index. The index is included in the 18 pages. Oh, thank you. Of single space type. This is an excellently prepared, in my opinion, and I was not the attorney who reviewed this. So I'm not saying I did a good job. Someone else did a good job in approving it. But someone did an excellent job in writing it. And this public offering statement starts off after the cover sheet. In the very first page, there's two statutorily required disclosures that our bureau requires that we implement, but that the legislature has required. First is the disclosure of how important the public offering statement is. You will note that it's in capitals and it's in bold. The statute authorizing public offering statements does not allow variations in the type unless the Attorney General's office requires it. We think it's so important right up front for people to know this document is the big cheese. You better read this as carefully, if not more carefully, than the purchase and sales agreement, because most of the time with the purchase and sales agreement, it's what's the price, when's the closing, and what are the add-ons. And then a whole lot of other stuff that can become important, but most of the time aren't. But everything involving a condominium is complicated. It is a pickup stick, for those of you who are old enough to remember that game, of legal rights and are very complicated. And no two condominiums are created equally or the same. The actual operation of a condominium varies greatly and significantly from one condominium project to the, to the other between who's responsible for what, what are the common areas, those are the areas that are owned jointly, what are the limited common areas, who's responsible for maintaining them, what things can be done on them. The purpose of the disclosure statement is so that people can understand for the particular condominium they're looking at purchasing and spending thousands of dollars on, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, what they're getting. Our concern is, is that from our experience already, particularly in automobile sales and other items where there's often sales that have been moving towards electronic primary or often electronic only transmission, is that it is far too easy for even the well-intending consumer to receive an electronic bundle that's going to have these 18 pages plus the hundreds of pages of attachments on their cell phone. And I've seen this happen when I've been at automobile dealers buying cars myself or when I, in my prior, prior private practice, represented automobile dealers, see people reading a 10 or 12 page very detailed retail installment contract or attempting to read it by scrolling. <laughs> and invariably, after they get the name and they check the price, the next thing they do is, where is the, the place where I say I've signed it and I initial it? In my private practice, and I was a long-term attorney, I have difficulty seeing Justice Lynn without a black robe on, so... <laughs> uh, I, I, it took me a while to be realizing that I could actually sit down. Um, but, but I've seen this in my own private practice where people bought things and they were told, hey, yeah, that's the legal mumbo jumbo. It's not important. <laughs> and they sign it. And once they've signed it electronically, once they've said yes, there is a five-day right of rescission by statute for condominiums and regulated land sales. But the five-day right of rescission is only meaningful if you know you need to look into what it is you said yes to. And if you've been convinced, either by your own, unfortunately, laziness or busyness, or you don't have good access to a computer 
like the transcriptionist has to where you can actually read it and come back to it, then we're making a mockery of protecting consumers. This will never be a concern with Riverwalk. If, as I said earlier, and I meant it, if the people who operate Riverwalk are, if everyone in the condominium industry was of the same caliber, we wouldn't need regulation. But I can tell you, we know that that's just not true. We receive complaints regularly regarding concerns regarding what's going on in condominium units. I know the board, the, the legislature is aware there's several bills right now, one involving the possibility of adopting establishing a board to deal with condominium disputes between unit owners and uh, the boards. We just think it is a mistake if we're going to be serious about protecting people in a very detailed, complicated legal transaction by encouraging them or allowing them to do electronic only. There's nothing that prevents this developer or any other developer from making electronic disclosure of everything so long as the consumer still gets a hard copy of their purchase and sales agreement and of their public offering statement. Even the public offering statement says how important it is to read it all the way through. Suggest making sure you understand the attachments and recommends talking to an attorney because these are hundreds of thousands of dollars of transactions per consumer typically. And once you've said yes, unless you realize there's a problem within the five-day rescission period, you're stuck whether you understood or not. So if our Bureau is going to actually live up to its name, Consumer Protection, if we're going to follow the mandate that the legislature gave us in both statute to enforce and administer for the protection of the consumers, these statutes, we believe that there still needs to be in-hand delivery. We don't care if it's by mail. We don't care how it is. Now, some people will say, well, that takes more time. Real estate transactions seldom close that quickly, so it's not that much more time for delivery. It amazes me that there is this thing called UPS that has overnight delivery, and it works very well. I know I've been using it for 30-plus years in my practice. Most, but not all, of these transactions involve some face time between, with the consumer. So we just don't get how it will be so burdensome on either consumers or developers to continue to require what our regulations have required since the very first passage of both of these statutes. If committee members have any questions, I would be glad to attempt to answer them. And if we need a translator, perhaps we can get someone to help me because I'm from southwest New Hampshire. <laughs> Senator Lang, you had a question? Yeah, yeah just a couple of questions. So is, is there an, a specific statute that says it has to be hard copy, or is that just administrative rules? That's just in our regulations. The statute merely says it has to be delivered. When both statutes were written, there was no such thing as electronic delivery unless you were the government um, or very wealthy corporations. Follow-up. Follow up. So again, given the advent of technology and everything you can do with technology, being a technologist myself, you know, things like DocuSign, you can make them initial every single page to make sure they've seen it and adopted it and read it and, and keep that as a transaction to show that the consumer or the person who, who is signing the DocuSign document um, read everything or at least they're initialing the page saying they've looked at it. Why would that not, Actually, I, I think that would probably be a better consumer protection because you mail somebody a document, you have no, no idea if it went straight in a trash can or if they actually looked at it. Where with an electronic means, you can actually require that every page gets an initial and that both, both parties know that they initialed it. Um, wouldn't that be a better consumer protection than just mailing and firing and forgetting? If I was confident, I even thought it was more likely than not that the mere fact that someone has to push the initial button 
on a DocuSign document, on whether it's one page or every page, I would say yes. I know from my experience as a private attorney, and I know based upon the experience being at the bureau and the complaints received, that unfortunately a lot of people stop reading after about the first or second page when they're doing it electronically. Technologists, people are used to using computers, people who have full-size screens, may well be a horse of a different color, as they said in The Wizard of Oz. We have to regulate, not because we have no ability to distinguish between the honorable, intelligent, scrupulous developer like Riverwalk and others. We similarly do not have the ability to write regulations for sophisticated, savvy consumers who are used to using computers for legal documents and are used to reviewing legal documents as opposed to those who I can't be bothered. Now, someone could say, well, what about that? We can't help people who won't help themselves. We shouldn't create a system where it's easy for people to not know what they're doing. And buying and selling a condominium, most importantly in this case, buying a condominium in a new development, because the, this all has to do with new developments, is not something that most people are familiar with, and it is fraught with legal problems and financial problems. I know this because I used to do it in private practice. I know this because since I've been at the Bureau, because of my previous experience, I've been doing a lot of condominium work. And unfortunately, a lot of it's not just been regulation, approval of new condominiums. A lot of it has been workouts and problems with condominiums that have either gone south or are going south or are having major disputes with the condominium association because what was promised, at least verbally, so it doesn't appear to be what the reality is. That's why we think a hard copy is the best way to go. For you, unnecessary. But I, I don't know how we could come up with words or regulation that would let us distinguish between the informed consumer and the savvy consumer. A fundamental principle of consumer protection work, both on a state level and a federal level, is that we look at the typical and average consumer in adopting regulations. For that reason, we think that requiring the hard copy is important. No one has to use it. So again, I, I guess my question comes around right now, I'm assuming if they send it by mail, there's some, all they do is they get a return receipt the person signed for it, but you have no, no idea whether they actually opened it or threw it in the trash can. None. It is no consumer protection around that. Just the, the, the river walk in this case would just say, oh, no, we sent it. Here's my verification. And that was it. It would just be the green return from the, from the post office, correct? The, the process is that the Bureau will never know unless there's a dispute. The, the, the developer is required to keep a copy of the signed acknowledgement. The, the Bureau's the regulations. Would be that green receipt from the post office? No. The actual, the, the public offering statement actually includes an acknowledgement of receipt and and that's included on on all um, public offering statements now some some developers do had do the initial on the bottom of the page things uh, we don't require that we take people at their word if they were if they said they got it they got it we can't make them read it we can encourage it Make sure it says it on the first page, and it says it more than one place in it that it should be read. All the information that we have regarding condominiums on our website, and we have various places for informed consumers to look and see you know, what you should look into, things to be aware of. We always say, read the public offering statement if you do nothing else. Um, but we can't make anyone do that. Anyone else have a question? Concern? 
Representative Leon and then Representative Schmidt. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for coming with all of this knowledge of this. Um, one of my other con questions and concerns is around what's going to happen with somebody um, if they pass away and it's only on their computer that nobody can access and what their heirs will do with the paper copy. I mean, obviously, we can't say that the person will file it in a real file cabinet instead of the circular file, but it gives a, I would think that it would, that would give a greater likelihood that there will be a copy available to those who survive the one who's contracted. I'm somewhat of a Neanderthal on this point, so I will readily acknowledge that if I was receiving something electronically only, and if I was receiving it on my personal device, as opposed to my work device, where I have a meaningful file system, even if it was still on the device, it would probably be not particularly readily accessible. After about three months, more or less six months or a year, but I may be behind the learning curve on that because I still hand my cell phone to my children whenever I want to learn how to do something new. Representative Schmidt, you had a, had a question? Well, it's a small matter, but you're not only being recorded, you're being videotaped, and you're operating under false pretenses because the si sign in front of you <laughs> re references your, your colleague who was before us about half an hour. He's smarter and better looking than I am, too. I won't comment on either one of those. Did but you have you, a question, Representative Schmidt? No, the question was whether he would like to remove that since he's being recorded. Ah. I'll be, and he answered it. Any other Senator, questions? Senator, Senator Gray? Uh, I think we have a case here where we've got the statute and we're kind of being asked to do committee work, okay, uh, on the thing. What, what we need to happen is for our, our staff uh, to tell us where we are, and if a legislative fix is needed, you know, have the department work with the legislature of their choice to get this done. So, I it it seems to me that the it's just a matter of interpretation of delivery of documents, and the agency has interpreted it in one particular way, and some stakeholder disagrees with that interpretation. That. It's Madam board. Chairman, if I could just briefly interject on that point, although we do believe the committee should reject this petition and deny it, we have suggested in our letter that the co if, if the committee is thinking that it might move favorably on the petition, we have requested, pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act in our letter, that this committee consider making a referral to the Commerce Committee, which normally handles condominium matters, and there's also a special committee that is formed under RSA 356B colon 70 and do, uh, regarding legislative and regulatory matters for condominium. And we've suggested that if this committee is tending positive regarding the petition, that perhaps it would be appropriate to have the expertise of those committees. But we leave that to the deference of the committee. Here. Representative Lynn? Yeah, so I was just going to say, um, I, I, I'm assuming that, that um, the, the, there's a representative here f who brought the petition, um, and I, I mean, I, so I assume we're going to hear from that person. I guess what I, the only comment I would make is, obviously I want to, I think we all would want to hear what the, what the, uh, the proponent of this change is, but my only, my only comment uh, is, I, I think you've made a very persuasive argument. The only the only comment I would make is, you know, if the, my sense is if this that rep, that what Senator Lang um, suggested, um, I think is I think is it's a it's a his point is very well taken. The problem I have is that I think you know if you were proposing if the petitioners were proposing this change, ten years from now, ten years in the future, maybe it would make more sense. But my sense is that you really are right on in terms of the way people nowadays, including, you know, Neanderthals like of my age, uh, who, you know, deal with electronic things. I think we are much more careful um, in dealing with things that are hard copies than, than we do things that are done electronically. And I'm not sure that it's limited to people that are my age, but certainly it, it, uh, it's true of people that are, you know, probably over 50 or 60. Um, and so for those reasons, I, th I think we should not make any change. I think your, your position is very well taken. Okay. Director Morrow. Um, early in the testimony from uh, Assistant A.G. Davis, 
he indicated that there was no prohibition to have an electronic copy in addition to the uh, hard copy. Um, you have a two-page attachment that contains the current JUS rules on this, uh, both on the first page in 1307.01 and on the second page in 1406.01. Um, it, it specifies how this is done and the requirements for uh, submitting this. Um, I don't disagree that perhaps an entity could get an electronic copy, but I do not believe from reading this, and I've read it carefully, that a reader would understand that that is available. Uh, paragraph C does talk about a waiver, but that waiver is only as to an alternative size and coloring of the paper. Just for clarification, I, I don't want to suggest that the regulation says, and oh, by the way, you can send an electronic copy. But they can, because there's nothing that prohibits it. I know it happens. Occasionally, we have developers who say, we want to do this as part of our marketing. Is this okay? And I'll say yes. And I'll say, I'll give you an email so you don't have to worry about it. But I know I can represent to the committee that a lot of declarants transmit the documents that way, but they still make sure that the public offering statement and the purchase and sales agreement, there's a hard copy. Well, actually, we don't require a hard copy on the purchase and sales agreement, but they often do them together because they have co-receipts on them. Yes. I, I think that if I were reading this, I would not take a electronic delivery as an option or even uh, something that could be done. So I would I would request that you revise the rule to say that for information only, you could a, an electronic copy is, is allowable and even encouraged. I don't think that I don't that have authority to say that I know we could do that, but I have authority to be able to tell you I could well imagine that as part of our next rulemaking, we would be doing that. But I can tell the committee right now, I know it happens without even being asked. Every time I get the question from a declarant, that's the person who's mm -hmm. doing the deck, the uh, condominium the attorney, I say, oh, yeah, of course. Do you want an email just so you know? <laughs> but Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you. I don't think we want people trying to read this thing on their phones. Uh, I'd go blind. But, um, but the electronic form, you know, can be can be used and and then you just keep the hard copy in, in your uh, paper files which are probably less voluminous than your computer files these days and, and just so it's clear to the extent that i haven't been bureau has no concern with electronic delivery of important documents our concern is this particular document the public offering statement is really the be all of the bee's knees regarding what you need to know at a minimum before you invest your money. And our concern is, is, is electronic only. Can I ask a clarification? Yes. So clar clarifying on that. So if someone like Riverwalk wanted to do, they could send out the hard copy. Could they also send out a digital copy and they get a digital signature? And if they got the digital signature, would it meet the needs of the of the organization? I think that I have to look at the comparison of our electronic signature statute and our regulations. I can't answer the question because I'm not sure how they coalesce right now. We would have no problem with conceptually, unless it's in our regs that I'm not aware of, and I don't think it is. We don't have a problem with electronic signatures. Purchase and sales agreements on condominium uh, purchases are often done electronically. Our problem, our concern is, is that the consumer not have a hard copy of the purchase and sales agreement. Again, we acknowledge they may read it or may not, but, but we think that the likelihood that they read it or at least skim it enough to where they, oh, I ought to know about that is greater if it's in paper than if it's electronically. Across the board, not for every consumer, absolutely not. Some won't read and some will Last read the electronic one. Yes. Excellent. Last follow-up. So again, again, the compromise is it could be both. 
So you could use a hard copy to meet the requirement of sending a hard copy, but get the signature digitally um, through another another means that has the same exact document. Y yes, and I think that might be happening now. Just the reason I say it might be happening now, the way this process works, just from a practical standpoint, is whatever what comes in, they're, whether it's a brand new project or they're adding units or adding, they have a proposal. We review the new proposal public offering statement. As you can see on the one that I that I sent you, you know, this has been edited over time as they as the project has changed. We approve it, they have to use it. We never know what's happening unless there's a complaint filed. So as a practical matter, I know that there's a lot of developers who do electronic signatures. I'm assuming they're doing them on both the per the purchase and sales agreement and the public offering statement, but I don't know that for a fact because we only find out about these things whenever there's a problem. I haven't heard of a problem with people saying, I didn't sign the document. I have had problems. We have had problems, not just J.R. Davis. The Bureau has had problems with consumers saying, I signed stuff electronically and I didn't realize what was in it. But both in the condominium world, in the automobile world, and in a whole host of other ones. But the automobiles are the one we see the most because that's one of the industries that certain dealerships, it's nearly, it's very problematic to get anything in paper previous to signing. Okay, Representative Hacken Phillips. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Chair. I um, could not agree more with uh, Mr. Davis about this matter as a practicing attorney in this specific field, I've represented both developers, senior citizens who have sold and purchased condominiums, and I've also handled some litigation over condominium um, enforcement of bylaws. So um, I think that this paper copy is critical. I think especially with the generation, folks who do not have computers, do not have email addresses, do not use electronic means of communication other than telephones, you know, landlines. So I, I think it, it, there are still people in our state who absolutely require paper copies. So I agree with you. Um, also, the industry is also making use of electronic data um, communication. And, you know, but with the agreement up front that they're willing to do the DocuSign situation, but it doesn't prevent, I mean, the developers are still required to send this documentation, which is a minimal expenditure for these folks who are already deep in the woods, of, you know, trying to invest these, you know, get these investments out and out the door, make money on their projects. So um, I'm sure that the representative here who is going to talk on behalf of Loon Mountain LLC will make mention of the expenditure that they're probably trying to avoid by having this electronic means. But um, I think, you know, it's a minor inconvenience for the seller. And I think it's important to maintain for consumer protection. So I would like to just go ahead and make a motion to decline the, the petition. I think it's unnecessary. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Okay. Second by Senator Ward. Uh, any? Madam Chair? Yes. We do have a representative uh, for the petitioner present. Yes. So we're, gonna, we're gonna deny it before hearing from him. Yes, that's a good point. But Madam Chairman, before before we go to the next part, I just one thing that you you made a suggestion about us thinking about amending our rule. One thing that I do let need to let the committee know, know is when I go back to my chief and we talk about this, one thing we will have to think through is timing. Because the statute says that the five day statutory right of rescission is based upon the latter of the signature of the purchase and sales agreement or the delivery of the um, public offering statement. And so if we had different deliveries electronically on one date, delivery by hand on another date, I don't want to get into a situation where I've created a statutory ambiguity. So we, in the process of doing that, it would probably be a situation where we'd have to have the timing be from whatever the latest of those three dates were, unless there was an amendment to the statute. Okay. Thank you. That's a I just didn't point. want to create a nope, mis- you know. We don't either. Um, if you could uh, let the representative from the petitioner. Good morning. 
I appreciate your time. Thank you all. I know we have a pending motion on the table, so I'll be brief. I know that attorney, uh, good morning, Caroline Leonard. Uh, I'm attorney with Gallagher, Callahan and Gartrell, and I'm here on behalf of my client, Riverwalk at Loon Mountain LLC. I have with me this giant stack of documents. I know you guys all just received, thank you, attorney Davis, uh, the 18 page narrative summary of the public offering statement. But what attorney Davis mentioned, but I wanted to give you the actual visual is this is the entire public offering statement under the statute for both the land sale disclosures act and the condominium act which governs subdivisions and condominium sales we are required developers are required to include a lot of different things as attorney davis alluded to in this document this is how big it is 407 pages um, that's not to say every resort has something this extensive riverwalk is a more complicated resort in my opinion um, but I just wanted to give you guys a flavor for this is what we're talking about. Um, every single consumer needs to receive all of this, not just the 18 pages attorney Davis shared with you, all of this. And these include the statutorily required components. So to touch on an earlier point about this notion of whether we go in the legislative direction of amending a bill or creating a bill, or if we are here during our regulatory phase, this aspect requiring physical paper delivery is mandated through the regulations. It's not part of the statute. As such, I would encourage the committee to address this in its auspices, under its auspices, as uh, the ability to effectuate rule changing. Um, I want to give you a little bit lay of the land as far as how these are done in other jurisdictions. Um, I also have the pleasure of representing uh, the American Resort Development Association, ARDA. They are an association, as the name would suggest, of various different um, developers around the country of resorts. I've been working with them on this in addition to our client Riverwalk. And they shared with me that in every major state around the country that sells timeshare condominium, they permit electronic delivery. We are behind the times in New Hampshire. And I really think to touch on Senator Lang's point, this, we could very readily accomplish a protective mechanism that permitted both electronic or paper delivery. And if you read our suggested change, that's actually what we're proposing. We're not suggesting only electronic. We're suggesting give the consumer the choice. If the consumer feels, I'm not comfortable reading something this big in electronic form, I'd really like a paper copy. Great, we will provide you one free of charge, no problem. We can build that in. But right now, the regulation does not allow that. It dictates mandates, paper only. I say, let the consumer decide. We don't need to be paternalistic. We don't need to make this choice for the consumer. You all know the benefits of electronic delivery. You can search. You can do control F. If you want to find a specific section on, say, dues, if I have to hunt through this physical copy, that's gonna take me ages. If I can just do a search quickly with my keyboard, I'm much more likely to find that quickly. Um, you all know the, the ability if you wanted to increase the font size, if you wanted, for example, to translate the document, if English might not be your first language. There are a host of different reasons why electronic really affords the consumer, I think, more protection. I say give the consumers the choice. Um, our revised language, we hope, strikes this balance between efficiency, better protection, and an ability to, if a consumer wants it, they can still have paper. We're not disputing that. If somebody wants paper, they can have it. Um, and I believe I heard a question earlier about uh, if somebody wanted to review the actual document in physical form. The statute actually already mandates that a resort always keep a desk copy of the current iteration of the public offering statement on site. So I, I think, uh, Representative Leon, it was your question as to an heir. If, if, for example, a beneficiary or a relative uh, knew that their parent or the deceased had had ownership at a particular resort, they could easily contact the resort. And again, I know I can only speak to my developer clients, but um, we are very happy to always accommodate such a request. Um, we can send it electronically, but we always, by, by law, we are required to keep a copy of this document at all times at the front desk. So if that helps alleviate concerns, I wanted to make sure we hit that as well. 
I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Lynn. I wonder if you could tell us that you said that that the, 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 the for this condominium, it's 400 pages or something. Yes. Could you give us some idea of uh, I assume you've represented other uh, condominium developers of sort of the average. Is that what the average uh, documentation is? Your Honor, mm -hmm. I'm going I'm to apologize for calling you Your Honor. I'm still going to tab it. Um, uh, <laughs> It, I'm going to give you the lawyer answer. It really depends. Um, it depends on the type of product they're selling. Um, if, for example, they're only selling whole condominium units, it might be a little bit shorter. If, for example, like this resort, they're selling interval interests, meaning somebody could own for a week, somebody could own for a few months, uh, that requires additional paperwork because you have to provide each type of ownership's corresponding paperwork. That's a very long answer to your question. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Thank you for the information. I appreciate okay. it. So we have a motion to deny the petition, the, the request for a petition. Is any further comments, questions, concerns? Representative Leon? Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think that this is a more complex issue, and I'm, I'm thinking it may make sense to deny the petition and go through the legislative process. And I'm sorry if I m missed any comments to the, to the similar one I needed to run out for a moment. Uh, yes, I would believe if Representative Hackett Phillips wishes to amend her, um, her motion to include a reference to the legislature, I would certainly hope that we could accept that. The committee is feeling that way, that's fine with me. Okay. Like I'll, I'll second the amended motion. Okay. Any further comments? Okay. Th th those in favor of denying the request for petition and referring it to the legislature, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Thank you. Okay. We will not pr pursue the petition at this point. We will... Uh, suggest that the Committee on Condominium Development or the Commerce Committee deal with be this be brought to the attention of those two committees. Uh, Scott Eaton just pointed out to me, he is still a committee attorney part time, uh, that when you voted on 2023 243 from Fish and Game, when you voted to postpone, um, it will need a waiver. Oh, it was? Okay. My apologies. I thought there was too. Okay. Never mind. All right. Is there any other business? All right. Thank you all. We are adjourned and we will not have a continued meeting. Uh, Thank <laughs> you.